Welcome to our very first episode of the Inside Syracuse Basketball Podcast. I'm Mike Waters, and coming up, Syracuse legend Dave Bing joins the show. Listen in as we discuss his experiences as a basketball player, a businessman, a politician, and a philanthropist. Dave, how are you? I am great, Mike. Good to talk to you. Well, I've been looking forward to this because, well, I look forward to talking to you anytime, actually. Uh, but in particular, this time I've been looking forward to it because I just got finished reading your new book, uh, a, a biography, Attacking the Rim. What made you decide to write a book? Well, um, the guy that runs my, uh, my mentoring program uh, has been a personal friend of mine for the last 30 years. And he's been working with me for the last eight, nine years uh, through the mayor's office and now with um, our Menti program. And he has a, um, a TV background. He was general manager of uh, one of our big stations here in Detroit. And so he was saying to me, you know, now that we've worked together for so long, I've gotten to know you quite well. And you've had uh, a hell of a history here. Why don't you write a book? And uh, it's something that I never thought about doing, to be very honest with you. So I thought about it for a while. And he said, you got one hell of a story to tell. So uh, think about it and, and, and maybe we should go forward with it. So he introduced me to uh, two or three different writers and we picked one. And this was back in January, February of this year. Okay. And so we started the process way back when. And uh, it was... It was an interesting thing for me to do because I had to go back and, and rethink and remember all the way back to childhood, which is a long time ago, <laughs> and, and try to bring it you know, current. So there are a lot of things, uh, obviously, that's happened in my life that's uh, somewhat unique, uh, especially with you know three or four different careers that I've been involved in. So uh, we started that process and uh, we finished it uh, a, little, a little over six weeks ago. And the publisher said, we, we, we need to get this done. So let's get it out before Thanksgiving. And uh, so here we are. Well, like I said, I, I got an early copy of it and I've read it already from uh, you know, cover to cover. It's absolutely fantastic. I've written a number of stories on you over the years, and I'm reading this book going, he's been holding out on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's some things that, uh, you know, I, I don't think I forgot them, but at the same token, uh, if somebody didn't pique my interest with a question, then there was no reason to talk about it. Yes, I, I do. I blame myself for not answering some of these <laughs> questions. Now, because if we could, some of the stories that I'm interested in, I mean, first of all, uh, your, your childhood in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, was really interesting to me. I grew up just north of D.C. in Montgomery County. So oh, yeah. we're talking about schools, uh, yeah. your high schools, your, your, even your middle schools in your neighborhoods. I know what you're talking about. That's amazing. That's amazing. So you grew up in northeast D.C. and you went to Spingarn. Syracuse fans knew that. I knew that. I never knew you played in high school against John Thompson. Oh, yeah. John uh, played, I, I think, was the best high school team I've ever seen, including now. John was 6'10 in high school. He was supposed to go to Spengarn as a public school because he lived right around the corner from Spengarn. But he was recruited by John Carroll, a uh, Catholic school. And so he wound up going to John Carroll at six foot 10. They had another guy by the name of um, Malloy, who was about six foot six in high school. He wound up being the president of Notre Dame. And then they had another guy who was six foot nine, uh, Tom Hoover. Their backcourt was probably one of the best backcourts that I've seen uh, in high school also, George Lefwich and, and John Austin. And Johnny Austin was an All-American high school player. George Lefwich was an All-American high school player. They won 59 games in a row over a two and a half year span. And we lost to them my 10th grade year in the city championship game. And uh, John and I were friends, you know, um, from childhood uh, all the way until he passed. 
That's amazing. Um, and of course, when you grow up in the city, no matter which city it is, you don't just play basketball at school and on your high school team, you play in the playground. You tell a story in the book about a young man that you play, well, actually he was about what, three or four years older than you, and you're play, you played playground basketball with him, and years down the road, that playground ends up being renamed for him. I don't want to spoil it. I want you to tell the story about who this guy is. Yeah. Um, it was Marvin Gaye. And Marvin and I, uh, we grew up in the same area, just a couple of blocks from each other. Uh, Marvin at that time lived in the projects, and the recreation center was between where I lived and where the projects were, where, where Mar Marvin lived. And Marvin would come down to the rec center and uh, he'd watch and every once in a while he, he would play, but he was not a really good player. Uh, but he'd be on the sidelines and a lot of times he would be singing with a few, few guys and, you know, we never paid much attention to him back then. We knew he had a nice voice, but we didn't know where that was going to go. Years later, we, you know, we found out, okay, Marvin is now in Detroit. And he has become a huge star, in, uh, well, not only just in Detroit, but nationally. And uh, when I came to Detroit, uh, we got back together again and uh, just relived some of the times that we had growing up uh, on the playground. That is so amazing that two kids growing up in Washington, D.C. both become Detroit legends. <laughs> yeah, and, and then the, the, the basketball playground ends up being named after the singer. Yeah, that's amazing. Some people would say, what, what happened? What did, what did you do that they didn't name the basketball playground after you when they did it for Marvin? Well, you know, I, I don't argue with that. Marvin, was a, he was a really good guy and uh, uh, no issues with that at all. No, no, you can't take, yeah, you can't take issue with that. Absolutely. Now, of course, you're going to go from D.C. to Syracuse. Syracuse fans, obviously, it's a Syracuse podcast. And I think one of the overarching stories uh, of, of, your, of your career is the fact that you played with a, a left eye that had been severely damaged when you were a kid. And I never knew exactly how it was damaged. I thought you were playing around it. But in the book, you truly explain just how that happened. And it involves a hobby horse. Yeah. You know, uh, as a kid growing up, poor, uh, you know, you, you didn't have all of the nice toys to play with. You had to make do. And so um, I nailed two pieces of wood together, um, and it was my hobby horse. And as a kid growing up at five years old, I mean, back then you watch TV and you see all the cowboy stories and what have you. And, and I, so I was a cowboy on my hobby horse. And I tripped over uh, a crack uh, in a sidewalk, and, and the nail wasn't always in the, in the two pieces of wood. And uh, just ironically, uh, I fell, and, 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 and my eye hit uh, with the nail. And uh, I thought it was just a bruise. It, it, you know, my mother thought it was just a bruise and hoped that it was a bruise because we didn't have insurance or anything for me to go to the hospital. So we thought it was going to heal, and it never did. And uh, so I have blurred vision uh, in that left eye all my life, even to today. And that's amazing that despite that vision uh, issue, that you achieved everything you did in basketball. And, and yet you say in the book that you actually liked baseball. Uh, you were a big Brooklyn Dodgers fan, and if it hadn't been for the eye injury, you might have kept continued playing baseball. Yeah, I played baseball from the age of 11, even until I got in high school. I played baseball all the way through high school. But as a right-handed hitter, you know, your left eye is your lead eye as a right-handed hitter. And I just really couldn't pick up the ball coming out of the pitcher's hand as we continued to, you know, to play against guys who were better and better. Um, so um, at the age of uh, 13 or so, I really started playing basketball. And basketball was the sport in Washington, D.C. And so even though I continued to play baseball, basketball became my, my favorite. Well, and Syracuse fans were probably pretty glad about that, actually. because <laughs> You know, the program was really down uh, when you came up here. Uh, Fred Lewis had just taken over. 
the program, I think, had lost 27 or some odd games in a row. Um, and Fred Lewis is putting together his first ever recruiting class, and you're going to be part of it. But he he was interesting. He he didn't recruit you with the basketball players on the roster at the time. He recruited you with the football guys. Yeah, you know, um, the big names on campus, I mean, Syracuse was a football uh, school at that time because Ernie Davis had just won the Heisman Trophy. Um, they had just played in the Cotton Bowl. And um, John Mackey was an All-American who was going to be coming back. And the weekend that I visited Syracuse, those are the two guys that, uh, that took me around and convinced me that Syracuse would be a good place for me to come. And it wasn't just about sports, because even though they were great football players, they were both good students. And uh, they talked to me about the kind of education that Syracuse had uh, offered them. And um, they said, you know, if, if you come here, you're gonna get a good education. But because this program is so bad, and we hear that you're a good player, um, you could help turn this program around. And uh, that weekend uh, was a determining factor for my, my making the decision to come to Syracuse. You know, you, you mentioned that not only were they great football players, but they were conscientious students as well. I, I know John Mackey was pre-law. Um, they're also both African-American. And you're coming from Washington, D.C., in an area that's mostly African-American. I know Spin Garn at the time was yeah. All, yeah. all black, right? Yeah. Um, how much of, of, I mean, obviously, it, Fred knew what he was doing. He, he paired a young African-American recruit <laughs> with these two young black guys in John Mackey and Ernie Davis. I mean, but that had to, to I mean, you, you are making a big leap coming to Syracuse, which at the time, uh, I don't even know if it was even 1% black. Yeah, we, we had, at that time, uh, my freshman year, uh, we had 14,000 undergrad students. And out of the 14,000, we had 100 black students, 80 boys and 20 girls. And okay. so, you know, so coming from D.C., uh, where from uh, kindergarten to the 12th grade, everybody looked like me. I mean, I never had a white teacher, never had a white classmate, never had a white administrator. And so all of a sudden I get to Syracuse and it was like, whoa, what, what am I doing here? Um, I didn't know all of those statistics or the data uh, at that time. I just knew that. They failed uh, to inform you of that? <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and they were smart. They, they didn't bring me up until May, and the weather had changed. So you got, you know, all of the girls and what have you out on the quad, and, you know, everybody's dressed a certain way or not dressed. And I'm saying to myself, oh, boy, this is going to be a nice place to come. But um, yeah, Fred Lewis was very astute in making sure because Syracuse had no black basketball players at that time. Mm -hmm. And so none of the, uh, the basketball guys uh, recruited me, even though I met them while I was there that weekend. Um, I did find out that we had no blacks on the basketball team. And, but Lewis had already confirmed to me that he had recruited one black guy from New York, which was Sam Pencil. Sam had already agreed to go to Syracuse before I did. Okay. So he says, you're going to have somebody else, you know. Um, and he says, but I don't want you to room with him. I don't want to put you two guys together. And that was another smart move because um, I don't think I would have gotten exposed uh, to a different kind of world and a different person uh, had not uh, Fred Lewis made that decision. So I went with Frank Nicoletti uh, my freshman year, and then Jim Beheim my, my sophomore and junior year. And I would tell you that those two guys that I went with are still two of my best friends. You mentioned that you and Frank Nicoletti remain friends to this day, and of course, you know, everybody up here knows about you and Jim remaining close to this day. But you mentioned Sam Pencil. And I've talked with Sam over the years, and I know, I think his freshman year roommate was Rex Trowbridge. That's right, yeah. So again, it was a young black guy and a young white guy, and, and Sam and Rex also, friends to this day. Yeah. Obviously, I think Fred Lewis, whether, I don't know if what his methods were, but, you know, he was creating a, a culture there where everybody was going to get along. And, man, it's amazing to see how you guys have all just remained so close you know, to this day. 
Yeah, um, you know, the, the team that I came in with, the freshman team, uh, I'm friendly with, I'm very close to, uh, to Jim, obviously, uh, to Sam, uh, to Rex, uh, to Dick Abelman, um, to Frank Nicoletti, um, and the only guy that's no longer here with us is Norm Goldsmith, who uh, got killed in a car accident after graduation. But all of us are still close. I see Chuck Richards. We uh, Three or four of us meet every year in Hilton Head for the last four years, just to kind of get together and, and, and talk about where it all started. And our relationships have remained very, very strong. That's fantastic. You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that there were some things in the book that I didn't know. This is obviously something I never would have even known to ask about, and I, and I wouldn't even ask about it now, except, well, you put it in the book. So it's fair game. Uh, you and your high school sweetheart got pregnant uh, during no, the she freshman did. year. She did. She got pregnant. You right. helped. <laughs> just a little, just a little. <laughs> yes. So, you know, um, you, what was that like as an undergrad and playing basketball at a high level and navigating through all that while also being uh, a, a married father? Um, it was it was tough. It was definitely very difficult. Um, her parents and my parents were old fashioned. And so when we found out that she was pregnant, uh, they all got together and said, you, you, don't have any, you don't have any excuse. You got no out. This is what you have to do. And you're going to get married. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got married in my freshman year. Uh, and she had uh, our first child um, uh, in my freshman year um, in April. And, and I kept it from everybody. Uh, Nicoletti was the only one, we were close, but he was the only one that knew. Really? And that was my freshman year. And my sophomore year, uh, the rest of my teammates found out, and then coach found out. And basically... Um, coach found out, huh? <laughs> yes. At that time, um, he, he, didn't, he didn't want any, any other of his players to get married because you had to concentrate on basketball and academics. And then if you got something else like a family you got to worry about or a job to take care of them, that was quite a bit for a young guy. But that's what happened to me and, and it, it all worked out. I had my second child at Syracuse. Uh, Bridget, my second daughter, was, uh, um, she, she was born in my senior year at Syracuse. So I had two kids as I finished college. That's amazing. Um, and then the fact that you, you academically, uh, in the book, you know, you kept your grades up and, um, you know, and, and had a great career. We'll spend just a, maybe another question or two on the Syracuse aspect of it. Um, as Fred Lewis hoped, they put that class together and he recruited well and he brought you guys in and you guys did turn the program around. Um, you know, is there anything that stands out uh, over your career, especially Either whether it was your sophomore, junior, or senior year, that was the, a, a moment when you guys knew uh, that you were going to be able to do everything Fred Lewis so hoped. Well, I think uh, as freshmen, we um, the field house was in its first year, and we scrimmaged the varsity, and we beat the hell out of the varsity. The freshman team did. We knew at that point uh, that we were going to be a pretty good team the following year because needless to say, freshmen could not play varsity. Okay. Had that been the case, our whole freshman team would have been on the varsity team because we were that much better than them. So they had a reason for losing 27 games in a row. They couldn't play. Um, now, now, be nice. I know some of those guys. <laughs> So when we became sophomores and um, three of us um, got, got into the start lineup, um, you know, Jimmy was not a, um, a scholarship player as a freshman uh, because there were no more scholarships available. And Fran Pincho um, flunked out of school. And so his scholarship became available and Jim became a scholarship player in his sophomore year. But I'll tell you, our, our sophomore year was pretty good. Um, our junior year was really a major disappointment 
because we thought our junior year with Rick Dean, with Ron Hopper and Valerie uh, coming in as, uh, as sophomores, that we were really going to be good. Our pre-rankings were in the top 20, but Vaughn flunked. And so he was, you know, the top recruit in high school. And uh, we were really depending on, on him to come and help us. And when he flunked out, um, that, that hurt us quite a bit. And so our, our, our junior year, even though we ended the season uh, on a high note, um, we, didn't, we didn't live up to expectations. And then Vaughn was eligible my senior year, and then we really turned the program around. Yeah, yeah. Then, you know, your, your, your senior year, you guys go to the NCAA tournaments, the school's first tournament uh, in uh, over a, probably about a decade, I think it was. And one game shy of the Final Four, a, a tough loss to Duke down in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, the NCAA made Duke uh, travel all those 20 miles <laughs> over to Raleigh. <laughs> Something never changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, after the disappointment of that loss, it was gonna, you were going to go into the NBA draft, and it was the Knicks or the Pistons. One of the two was going to get the number one overall pick, and you and Cassie Russell of Michigan are going to be one or two. And obviously the coin flip goes the Knicks way. They pick Cassie. You know, it's kind of ironic that the New York City team takes the Michigan player and the Detroit right. franchise gets the, the guy out, out of the New York. How much different do you think your career, your life would have been if maybe the Pistons had gotten the number one pick and taken Cassie and you went number two to New York? Or, you know, what if New York had decided to take you number one overall? I think my life would have been really different um, because New York, uh, you know, it it was a mecca of basketball. Um, And, you know, Syracuse had so many fans and alumni in the New York area. And I think a lot of folks was hoping that the Knicks would draft me. And I was hoping that also. I just assumed that was going to happen. But it didn't happen. Um, you know, Cassie was a great player, and I think he was the number one player uh, in the country at that time. But I also knew I wasn't too far behind. Um, and so it never bothered me that I went to um, – I thought I was going to be a Nick, and it didn't work out that way. And I didn't know anything about Detroit um, other than that they were a bad team. <laughs> Uh, and I knew I was going to have it just like Syracuse. I knew I was going to play. Um, so um, as it turned out, um, it, it's, it's ironic that the best thing happened. I had nothing to do with it, you know, the draft itself. The Pistons draft me, and uh, from that point forward, uh, my, my life was different. And, and there was no draft back then the way there is now. It wasn't held in New York uh, at a – <laughs> at the garden or a fancy hotel and you didn't get to dress in a million dollar suit the story of how well you tell that draft night story i can't set it up at all this is too good well it was, it was a 20 dollar coin that the butcher who was the coach at that time supposedly he was practicing flipping this coin so it would end up heads and he flipped it uh, after during the draft it came up tails. So New York got the right to the first draft pick. And I know that Bush was devastated. And he was a coach, 26 years old, player coach. Mm. And it was obvious to me that I was not Detroit's choice. And everybody wanted Cassie, and I accepted that and understood that. And I, don't, I won't say I had a chip on my shoulder, but I surely had something to prove because I wanted the people in Detroit to know that, hey, you got a guy that can play. And uh, you don't have to feel sorry for me. I, I'm going to show you guys that uh, you did not make a mistake. And so things, things worked out very well in my behalf. And I loved it in the book when you said that you listened to the draft on the radio <laughs> in a dorm room or uh, with, with some of your Syracuse teammates, including Jim Beheim. Yes, yep. And, you know, I mean, that's the way it was back then. I mean, the entertainment factor today uh, for pro sports, it doesn't matter which sport, it's just off the charts. I mean, you know, even today, our young kids who are 
sports advocates, they can turn on the TV any day, any time of the day, and they're going to see great players in whatever sport that they like. Mm -hmm. Back then, you were lucky if you got on TV once a month. Um, even at the pro level, because there, you know, the, the game was just changing, and the, the, the top franchises were the Lakers, the Knicks, and the Celtics. And if you didn't play one of those teams, you didn't ever get seen on TV. And so that's just the way it was, and you had to accept it and live with it. So there were some struggling years there with the Pistons, but um, you know, obviously Detroit's going to be become like a home for you. Uh, even though you get traded and you're going to bounce around, you know, at the end of your career, you, the significant portion of your career is with the Pistons and Detroit becomes home. But I, I was always, you know, wondering what it would be like back in those days, late 60s, early 70s, with some of the civil unrest, uh, the Vietnam Wars going on as well, civil rights, um, what it was like to be uh, a black athlete in a major city like Detroit. Um, Detroit, like Washington, D.C., was a predominantly African-American city. But the difference was that D.C. was a white-collar town because of politics, government. Mm -hmm. um, Detroit was just the opposite, a blue-collar town because of the automotive industry. Um, but I was, after a short period of time when people had a chance, number one, to see me play, um, everybody changed their minds pretty quick and said, you know what, we, we did get the right guy. But as you talk about the tumultuous times in the um, late 60s, early 70s, um, it, it was very difficult, no doubt about it. Um, and I was exposed to some things uh, as a black athlete uh, in a city like Detroit. Um, the, the politicians, the business people, everybody was coming to you to get your opinion, to make sure you got engaged, you got involved, et cetera, et cetera. So even though there were tough times for the country, Detroit itself uh, welcomed me with open arms uh, back then. And they, I think, respected my work ethic. I think they respected uh, what I tried to do in the community in terms of not trying to have a big head and trying to help as many people as I could. Um, I was totally engaged in the city. And, um, you know, I, I enjoyed those years. I'll be very honest with you because I made a lot of friends. So you didn't play your entire career in Detroit. As we said, you know, you go to Washington, you play with the Bullets. You, you, there was a short stint with the Celtics. Why, after your career is over, did you decide to either go back or remain in Detroit? I remained. Even though I was traded, I, my first nine years was Detroit. I made so many friends in Detroit and, and, and fell in love with the city. Um, even when I got traded, I had a no trade clause in my contract. And so when the Pistons came to me and said, we think that, you know, we'd like to trade you. Uh, we know you have a no trade contract or clause in your contract. And so we've got options right now. And well, you've got options. We, we've talked to the Lakers, we've talked to the Celtics, and we've talked to the Bullets. And, you know, which team do, do you think you want to go to? And I said, well, um, I think the Bullets, and that was my home where I grew up, and the Bullets had just lost in the championship series to the Golden State Warriors. So they had a good team. Mm -hmm. They had Elvin Hayes, they had Wes Unsell, they had Phil Chenier, they, they had Mike Rick. They had a pretty good team. So my feeling was, okay, um, that's a pretty good situation for me to go in. I can't go there and be the same star that I was in Detroit because they've got so many good players already. So I've got to figure out how I fit in. And, you know, I knew Wes well. I, I, I knew, I didn't know Shania very well at that time, but I knew he. Um, we were friends. And so it, it, it was not a tough thing for me to do. Um, the toughest thing was that when I was traded, it was like in August. 
And so I couldn't, I didn't have time to move my family. I had three daughters and I didn't have time to move my family to Washington. So all of a sudden at 32 years old, um, I'm kind of by myself for the first time in my adult life. So my parents wanted me to move, move back in the home with them. At 32, I'm saying, oh, wait a minute. I don't think that's, that's a good idea. So I got an apartment uh, in, in Washington, and my family stayed in Detroit. So that first year, I was fortunate um, that Casey Jones was the coach. And Casey was a good guy. Not a good coach, but a good guy. So it, it, it was an easy trans, transition for me. And so between uh, Casey and, and those teammates and being back with the people that I grew up with, that first year, even though my family wasn't there, uh, wasn't, wasn't all that tough on me. The second year, my family moved down. I moved everybody down to, to D.C., but I kept my home in Detroit because I had already made up my mind that Detroit was going to be home, not moving back to D.C. You know, your post-playing career – is probably even more successful or more amazing than your playing career. It's, um, you, you, you start your company, and I, I think I read in the book, you, you start with four employees, and, and over the myself. years, yeah. Yeah. right? Four employees yeah. you started with, yeah. and over the years it expands to 1,400? Yes, yeah. So we, uh, we, we had a company that uh, was an automotive supplier, and um, we had a tremendous growth over 28 years, uh, both in terms of revenue and in terms of people. Uh, I had six plants in the city of Detroit. The automotive industry was, was very good for minority-owned suppliers uh, until probably the 07, 08 timeframe when the industry itself was suffering. And at that time, they were trying to stay alive themselves, and so they couldn't be as supportive for the supply base as they had been prior to that time. But um, Detroit itself um, uh, was a city that was also very supportive of, uh, of minority entrepreneurs. And we had uh, the first African-American mayor, uh, Coleman Young, very progressive in his thinking. and. Um, Good things were happening in the city and until we got, uh, until we, until the downturn, because this area was so dependent upon the automotive industry, where you had people without a high school education uh, making middle class incomes. You know, people were making seventy, eighty thousand dollars in the plant without a high school education. And, the, and when, the, when the, the downturn happened, um, a lot of those people obviously were no longer had a job and were out looking for a job without the skill set and the education that was necessary to move into another uh, to another area. So you've been a successful businessman there for almost what two decades at that time. You mentioned the downturn in about 07, 2008. It's about a year or two after that where somebody convinces you, a lifelong businessman, that you're needed in, in politics and you run for mayor of Detroit. Why in the, how in the world did anybody convince you to, to go there at that time, especially, <laughs> um, and run for mayor? Oh, it wasn't easy. It wasn't an easy decision for me. I mean, it's not something that I wanted to do, but the the former mayor before me was uh, Kwame Kilpatrick, a, a young man with just unbelievable potential. I supported him for his two terms that he ran. Uh, he was good at what he did. Uh, I knew his mother and father who were both in politics. I knew them very well. They were my age and we grew up here together. But um, a lot of negative things started to happen and come out in the media about what was happening with Kilpatrick. And the business community first lost total confidence in him because they couldn't trust him anymore. And they needed somebody uh, in the mayor's office that they could work with, they could trust, uh, bring the dignity back to the office of the mayor. And so I was part of a group, um, like a selection committee, trying to figure out who, was, who could we convince to, um, to become the next mayor. 
And as we kept looking at people, um, this was over a couple of months period, it kept coming back to me. Everybody was saying, you know, we're looking for the right person. We think you are the right person. And I, I wasn't ready for that. Um, I'm 64 years old. Um, you know, I've had a nice uh, basketball career. I've had a nice business career. Um, I was well-respected and well-received by the people here in the city. And I knew if I went into politics, a lot of those people who respected and liked me would all of a sudden turn against me because I don't care who you are as, as a politician, uh, you're gonna have 40 plus percent of the people that will never agree with you. Sure. But, but you know, I, I had to think bigger than myself. And, um, and, and, and I thought Detroit needed this change. And so I became the change agent and I, I ran for mayor and, and, and won a runoff um, in a special election. And then four years uh, later, um, you know, I had another four years in the office and those were the most difficult years of my life. What made it so difficult? I mean, I get it, pol politics, the, everything Detroit's going through at the time, but what was the one thing that made it the most difficult? We were broke. <laughs> we were broke. We had no money. And so all of a sudden, you got, you know, 700, 800,000 people because Detroit was losing its population. We went from a million five when I first got here. At that time, we were about just north of 700,000 people. And, um, and, and, and Detroit was considered to be one of the poorest cities in the country. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then with the political shenanigans that were going on, you know, nobody had much respect uh, for, for the city. Um, I didn't know the depths of uh, the financial crisis that we were in uh, before I got into office. When I got into office, my business background, I think, kicked in and helped me quite a bit. And because I had been a, a, a big community guy, you know, people were willing to give me a chance. But I had to tell people the truth. I, I didn't want to sugarcoat things like, you know, we're going to be okay. I knew that we were bankrupt. It was just a matter of when are you going to file for bankruptcy? Um, we had lost our tax base. We didn't get any help from the state itself. Fortunately, uh, Obama was the president and Joe Biden was the vice president, and I knew both of them. And they really helped uh, the city out as much as they could. So between the Department of Transportation, between HUD, between Department of Education, all of those secretaries were very, very supportive uh, of Detroit but they couldn't get us enough money to get out of the, the debt that we were in. We were $18 billion in debt and long-term liabilities. Oh and we didn't, have a, yeah, we didn't have a tax base, we didn't have a revenue base to do anything. So all of a sudden people are demanding the trash be picked up, the garbage be picked up, the lights be turned on, the buses will run on time, the police department, the fire department, you name it. And we didn't have enough money to run any of our departments efficiently. Fortunately, um, I knew all of the business leaders. And uh, early on, uh, I went to them. And when they asked me what could they do to help, um, I told them exactly what we needed. And, and, and none of them could give me the money that was necessary to turn the city around. But they were very supportive between the business community and our foundations, the nonprofits. Okay. Uh, they both came to the table in a big way and helped us stave off bankruptcy for the first three years. But that's when uh, the governor made the decision uh, to bring in um, uh, a, uh, an outside person, if you will, uh, a manager, uh, emergency, manager. Yeah, emergency manager. And he came in for about the last six or seven months of my term. And it was ugly um, because. Um, hard decisions had to be made. And um, I don't think the governor uh, felt that we could make those decisions, myself and my administration and the city council. So he brought in this emergency manager who I think did a good job. Um, I worked with him, um, you know, all the power was transferred from the mayor 
to the emergency manager. And most people thought, oh, this is going to be ugly. You know, this is not going to go well. But I said, there's no sense in me fighting this guy. Uh, he's going to get the support that I didn't get from the state. So I may as well get to know him as best I can, work with him. And he came to me and said, I, I don't know the city. You run the city. I've got to take the city through bankruptcy. Wow. And so he said, uh, you know, that's something that you don't want to do. So let me do that because I don't live here. You know, when this is all over, I go back to D.C. to, to my law firm. So in the end, uh, it worked out. Wow. It's an amazing thing. And, and uh, you know, now with Joe Biden as the president-elect, I'm sure they're going to call upon you to fill a cabinet position of some sort. <laughs> and, and you're both Syracuse grads, right? It'll be, a, it'll be the kitchen cabinet. I'll be in the kitchen somewhere. <laughs> you know, one last thing, you know, playing career, business career, the political career, but there's one other aspect of your life that I have to touch on before we let you go. And that's that over the years, you've been a mentor to a, a, a lot of young kids in the city of Detroit, um, African-American kids who maybe need, you know, a mentor in their lives. You know, we, we know famously the story, you knew a young Derek Coleman, but I, I know that in, in the book, uh, one of the, uh, the forwards or, or, you know, the blurbs for the book is written by Jalen Rose. Yeah. Uh, you know, who didn't go to Syracuse, uh, but shame on him, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but why and 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 how did the, the mentorship program come about? Well, I've been lucky all my life. I've been mentored. Uh, fortunately, I had a dad that was in my home. Mm -hmm. But there were people, uh, my coach, um, the recreation uh, leadership the older guys in the neighborhood where I grew up, grew up in Washington, they were all mentors. I mean, they, they looked at kids like me growing up. And if they saw us with some kind of potential, they wanted to make sure that we stayed on the right track. And I can remember several times where, as a kid growing up, I mean, you do like everybody else, you do something that's wrong. And, you, and if, if there's nobody there to tell you about it and, and put you on a corrective path, there's no telling where you end up. So all of my life, uh, I've been around people to, who've reached out to help. And so um, that's all part of me right now. Um, they're, they're, they're kids over the years that I've been in Detroit where I knew, I knew they needed help. I knew people didn't care about them. I knew people just told them what they couldn't do, not what they could do. And so, you know, I guess, in a roundabout way, I was doing mentoring then without knowing much about it. So at the end of the, um, uh, of the political career, uh, the guy um, uh, that worked with me very closely was a guy by the name of Bob Warfield. And when he asked me what I wanted to do, you know, you're still young, you're still healthy, uh, you still got things that you can achieve. What do you want to do? And that's when we said, we got to take care of some of these young kids because in, 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 in our community, in our school system, black boys who entered the ninth grade, only 50% of them graduated from high school. So they went to prison, uh, they got into the drugs, they got into what was happening in the streets, um, and we knew that that wasn't a good thing. Um, a lot of these boys grew up in a single parent home, usually with a mother there, with no father, with no man in their lives, and we felt that if we could uh, make a difference by introducing these kids to a man that was positive, uh, a mentor, um, that we could make a difference. And we've done that. We, we have now over 100 kids in our program. We have over 30 some kids have graduated from our program. And of those 30 plus kids, 20 plus are now in college. And they will come back and be useful citizens are here in the city of Detroit. So, you know, people would say, well, those are not big numbers. But when you multiply those numbers by the people that they're going to touch, um, we know that we're doing something that, that's right. And uh, the hardest thing for us is to get enough uh, black men 
to step up and be a mentor to these young boys. And we've been very fortunate because I've been here a long time, know a lot of people. People know me pretty well. They know my heart's in the right place. And so they come to the table to help out. And that's what we've got to continue to do. And this is probably the most gratifying um, career that I'm having, to be very honest with you. I know I'm making a difference. Well, that says something, given how uh, successful you've been in, in every other career uh, throughout your life. Um, th this has been a, a great conversation with you. I, I appreciate your time. Um, any everybody listening to, to the podcast, I encourage you to go out and find Dave's book. It's Dave Bing, Attacking the Rim. It, it's a great read. And, and believe me, we didn't give away anywhere near uh, 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 all the stories that are in the book. There's a lot more out there. Um, poker games with the four tops, another eye injury in your pro <laughs> career. Uh, yeah, there, there's some stuff. I'm telling you, it, it, it was really enjoyable. Dave, listen, I, I can't thank you enough for spending this some time with me today. Mike, thank you very much. And hopefully when, when things get back to normal, whatever that is, I'll see you again in Syracuse. I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.